vegetation-based surveillance, employee tracking devices, and five million of you are infected with snooping adware. We're watching you on Tech News Tonight. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 335 for Monday, May 11th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company information. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to the show where we talk about the tech news with the people who are as interested in it as you are. I am Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the news. A town in Arizona is hiding license plate readers in fake cactuses or cacti. The town has been installing the readers since February in order to check license plates against a national registry of stolen cars. Here to talk to us about the privacy ramifications of this new vegetation-based surveillance system is Russell Branham from The Verge. Welcome, Russell. Thank you for having me. That was your term, I think, vegetation surveillance system. Yeah, well, <laughs> and it's it's a fake it's fake vegetation. So you know the deception goes even deeper. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is a, a combination of, I guess, to a mildly controversial tactic with a legitimately controversial one. Um, I mean, I think you know uh, a lot of people are maybe already aware of fake cell tower trees, um, and in the southwest, they're often cactuses or cacti. Uh, and so that it's basically they started with that and they had the license plate readers and they sort of thought, well, we'll just make them less inconspicuous and it'll, it'll be prettier for everyone. But a lot of people who are concerned about license plate readers already say, you know, you're hiding this device. Suddenly someone drives by. They think it's just a cactus. They have maybe they have no idea that their town is even installing these as many times police prefer to keep these things, you know, uh, secret. And that, you know, putting it in a cactus does start to send off some suspicious signals. Right. So it's like they just wanted it to blend into the environment, but then it's suddenly creepy, like all of these kinds of things. And it's like, it's okay until then suddenly everyone's watching you. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think this is one of those things where if you want people to be comfortable with these devices, you want to be as transparent as possible. I think that's always uh, a good policy. And, you know, the thing that people are really concerned about with the license plate readers, sort of beyond the whether they're in cactuses or not, is you don't know where the data is going once it's taken. So police say, you know, in this case, this town says we're just using it to check against this national register of stolen cars. So if your license plate isn't in one of these, then, we're, you know, we'll delete it as soon as we have it. But a lot of the work the ACLU has done has has discovered that that's often not the case, often you know, a town will set up 20, maybe 50 license plate readers across the town. And if they keep all the license plates, then when they find out later, oh, you know, this guy with this license plate was, you know, going around robbing convenience stores, they can plug that into the database and see, you know, basically everywhere he drove during the entire period that they have data for. And it becomes this really comprehensive view of someone's movements and potentially really private movements. Um, but it's sort of all about how long the data stays around, who has access to it, which is one of those things that's very hard to make transparent. You know, it's, it's very hard to say for sure how long that data is being kept unless towns are really proactive about sharing what their system is. So in this town, I mean, are there people demanding where are you keeping this data? How long are you keeping it? I don't know that it's reached that far. I think it's so it's sort of a suburb of Tucson and um, or Phoenix, excuse me. Um, and I think, yeah, at the moment, they have they were asking questions about the license plate readers, and I think police have si police had said we're only checking it against the National Registry. And so far, I think that's where the, that's where the issue has stopped. Uh, so hopefully, that's all they're doing, and uh, the people of the town have, have all the answers they need. All right. Well, we'll keep watching this story, watching them watch us. Let's talk about <laughs> another story you reported last week about a Google survey that found that more than 5 million users were infected with adware. Now, these are ad injectors. That's malware that gets on your system and it displays its own ads on websites. 
Google said that 5.5% of the requests were from IP address infected with malware. Is this adware like Superfish that we talked about a few months ago that was everywhere? Absolutely. And Superfish was one of the primary ones that they found. It's still a huge player in that market, uh, you know, even though it isn't coming pre-installed on Lenovo computers anymore. Um, but it's absolutely that. So they're, you know, they're, uh, a lot of the way that this stuff gets distributed is if you uh, do a Google search or a Bing search for a free piece of software like WinZip, you'll find, you know, you'll probably find the first result will be WinZip, which is just a free download. But if you click on the sponsored link, it will be someone who has sort of a free bundle of software and there's WinZip, but as you're installing it, it also wants to install a bunch of other sort of PC optimizer or, or sort of less reputable sounding things. And those, you know, so the way that they're making the money that they're paying for the ad, uh, that they're using to pay for the ad is by installing adware with that bundle. And a lot of people fall for this. It's, it's a surprisingly large problem. The reason the Google survey is interesting is it's one of the first surveys that's just looked at the entire population of people visiting a very popular website. So, I mean, we, it's, it's Google's network of sites. And of those people, 5.5 of them, sort of over the, this four-month span, had AdWords. So if you average it out, they only found 5 million IPs, but if you average it out, it's over 10 million. I mean, it, it suggests a population of over 10 million computers that are that are infected with this, which is really much larger than I think e even the AdWare experts would expect. And you say, you point out that it might even be bigger than this because they're talking about Google and a lot of these sites don't target the bigger sites like Google, the more they go to the yeah. less reputable sites. Yeah, so it's very so. So what it does is when you visit a site, it sort of looks for the the little ad units, and like an ad blocker, it'll just block it. But instead of blocking it entirely, it replaces it with another ad from that that sort of pays back to their their own advertising network. Right. Um, so yeah, a lot of them, you know, it's it's cheap for them to just drop this when you're when you're visiting a Google site, right? It's it's not that much revenue for them. And that's generally how networks like this get detected. So if you're on the anti-adware task force, you know, it might be at Google or at some law enforcement agency or some security firm. You're looking, you're trying to sort of get the most bang for your buck. So when you do the scan you want as large a site as possible. And that encourages a lot of the adware people to say, well, you know, we don't need that much. We don't need to be injecting into every site. Let's just inject into the small sites where we're pretty sure we're not being monitored and kind of play it a little bit safer. So with people who have this adware, they're not being really tracked. I mean, the, the victim here is Google or the other websites that advertise because they're losing advertising yeah. dollars. Like I mean, we're not losing one anything. I think it's also the victim is still the user if you're if you're loading up your web browser and it's so full of ads and sort of pop up just junk. I mean, the reason they, it's sort of uh, crapware is the other term for it, just because after a while, if you have enough of these, it just becomes so unpleasant to use the computer at all that you just sort of have to buy another computer. Um, it, and it's very difficult to get rid of these because they function as viruses. There's no uninstall button. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, I'm not... Uh, otherwise, playing a violin for Google, I'm sure they will get get by just fine. But I, I do think it's a shame that that all these people, you know, millions of people clicked on the wrong link and are just having their experience of the Internet. It, it is basically unusable because they can't get past these ads that are just being shoved in front of their face. Right. In the case with Lenovo, I mean, they targeted the Superfish was on yeah. low-end laptops. So yeah. conceivably, those are for people that might not know any better. You know, they Yeah, might, well, you know. I mean, I think that's it's any of these scams, I think, you know, the educated consumers, it's like I said with the WinZip example, these are people where if they do the Google search for WinZip, they're going to know not to click on the sponsored link and just go to the non-sponsored link that says WinZip. And I think, you know, educated users are also probably more reluctant to install software that where they don't know where it comes from, right? Or if software is bundled, maybe be more suspicious of that. Um, and those are very good habits to adopt. But I also think we want a computing ecosystem that doesn't 
you know, where, where even less savvy people can still sort of get by and use computers and have a positive experience. Exactly. Um, I mean, and the other thing is a lot of the companies, you know, we think of this as something that sort of sketchy hackers or, or, or whatever, you know, so, something that criminals do. But a lot of these companies, uh, Superfish, you know, the, the makers of Superfish very much included, are completely legitimate em- enterprises and in many cases very profitable, publicly traded in other cases, um, and are sort of, getting off scot-free in many cases just because there's no, uh, yeah, there's there's no sort of way of getting at them. Right. So is Google doing anything to stop this? They are. So this is, they've actually been criticized a lot. One of the people um, I, I quote in the piece, uh, Ben Edelman, has been an outspoken critic of uh, Google on this, um, on this front, essentially saying if someone's doing a search for free software, and you're showing them a sponsored link. The only person that's ever going to pay for that link is an adware vendor. And so that's his claim. And he says, you know, Goog- he, he's been sort of dinging Google and, and more recently uh, criticizing Bing for, for similar practices. Um, and Google recently, just last month, uh, said that they were not going to accept ads on AdWords for uh, those programs anymore. So they have various... Uh, sort of categories that aren't you can't advertise for. So you can't advertise guns or, or sort of things like that. Um, and now free desktop software is one of those categories. And I think it is, it's a little unusual, I think, for people who aren't familiar with this ecosystem of, well, why would they ban that? But this is essentially why, because otherwise you get, pe- of the people making these these searches, the sort of less least savvy 10% just get all of this adware loaded onto their computers because they don't know any better. All right. So over at Ars Technica today, there was a story about yes. a worker fired for disabling the GPS app that tracked her 24 hours a day. Uh, the employee worked for a money transfer company called Intermex, and they required their employees to install job management software called Zora, I think it's pronounced. It was on their company iPhones. And then when she uninstalled it, she was fired. I know you're a privacy expert, so I wanted to get your take on this. What do you think about this story? I mean, I am very, I'm watching the results very closely. I think ours did a great job uh, digging this up. Um, I'll say, I don't, I don't know. I think the question of, the question, what it comes down to for me is, when are you on the clock and when are you off the clock, right? So her point is, you know, this is my phone. I'm carrying around all the time. And this app is tracking me as long as I'm using my phone, I don't have an easy way of switching it off when I'm off duty. And so, you know, maybe my employer wants to know where I'm going while I'm at work and while they're paying for my time. But once, you know, the five o'clock bell rings and I'm on my own time, I'd rather not be feeding data back to them about my whereabouts. Um, Now, I think the idea that your employer might require you to have an app on your phone right? My employer requires me to have Slack on my phone in case they need to reach me. Um, And I think that is something that, again, I don't know the legal precedent for that, but I think intuitively that makes a certain amount of sense. If if it's terribly onerous, you know, maybe she could ask, I I wonder if it was an employer provided phone. It was. Well, so then in that case, they could say, well, if she wanted to have her own personal phone and only uses for work use. But I also think, I mean, the, these, in some sense, uh, I think that's going to be what decides the, the legal ruling. Mm-hmm. But the larger trend here that, that's interesting is people are being intensively tracked in the workplace. And I think we've seen this in specific jobs. I think this is a more white collar job that we haven't seen a lot of. But Warehouse workers, the trucking industry has been extremely aggressive in tracking sort of exactly where you are at every moment. And so if you if you pull over for a bathroom break, they're going to know about it. And if you're pulling over for too many bathroom breaks on the on the ride, they're going to ask you about it and have a problem with it. And I think that is also invasive. I think the, the idea that, okay, we're paying you during these hours, so you know we have a say in what you do, 
there's a question of how far, you know, where we want to draw that line, even when people are on the clock. Um, but I think that's also, it's a, it's a tougher sell just because we don't have a, a, as strong of a history of litigation in that area. Right. Um, I, I think yeah. you're right. It's the, I mean, it is, it was a company phone. So, you know, there's that, but it's the, it's the way they were sort of joking. I mean, the, her boss was joking about like, I can tell if she's speeding, you know, when she, you know, it's the, yeah. it's the way people are handling this kind of like, oh, it's no big deal. We're being tracked. And that I think that. Yeah, no, it's troubling. Well, especially I think because, so there are two trends, right? One is more and more business is happening on personal devices, right? Because instead of having a corporate design phone that's just a corporate phone, personal technology has gotten so good and consumer technology for those devices, you know, apps have gotten so good at doing all of the things that one needs to do in the workplace that if you're not using a consumer app on a consumer device, you're not using the best technology that's available to you. So there's a huge push for commercial off-the-shelf technology in professional contexts. But then also, because of how consumer technology and apps are typically monetized, if you're using a piece of software like this, the norm is very much that there it's going to collect all the as much data as it possibly can because in many cases it needs to monetize that as marketing data right. now professional software it used to be the norm was that this would be paid for by the employer but because now it's happening in the context of consumer software it's sort of normalized that well you know of course the app knows where I am 24 hours a day, right? I'm not surprised that, that it has access to that because that's completely the norm for this for this type of software. Right. Well, I mean, I can remember a time, I'm showing my age, but in the mid to late 90s where I wouldn't even consider getting a work email at home. And now yeah. like, I can get it in the bathroom because it's right yeah, there on my the, wrist. <laughs> yeah, no, your boss will be sending you the digital heartbeat and you'll yeah. know, oh God, I'm in trouble now. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's... So that's the thing, I think, and because there's no division, right? I mean, you could imagine if it was Microsoft Outlook, and to actually to make the analogy using only Microsoft products, you might have Hotmail as your personal email, and then Microsoft Outlook was your work email, right? And these products looked very different because they were, one was consumer and one was office, and they functioned totally differently, and maybe one of them, you know, you had a Palm Pilot that let you check Microsoft Outlook, but you wouldn't, these were in very different spaces. And it was, we sort of, the norms for them were different because the norms for consumer technology are different from the, than the norms for professional technology. But all, all those distinctions have been collapsed because it's all the same technology now. Right. Well, thank you so much, Russell. Russell Brandom is a reporter for The Verge, and we always look forward to talking to you. So thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. Take care. Coming up, this is why we can't have nice things, and Google tries to prove that machines are better than people. But first, many of you use Dropbox. We do too, and at Twit, we use it to sync and share files. Everything from sharing audio MP3s, large graphic files, to invoices and program schedules. I use it for this show to share links to screenshots. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. So what is Dropbox for Business? It's the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust, which means less training and more productivity. Simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte and it's easy to expand. It's like an endless cloud. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. And most importantly for IT professionals, you get control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security administration tools, and the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. 
Want to give it a try? Take advantage of the fact that your employees already know and understand Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Now on to a few more stories we're following today in the This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things news after a few snafus and embarrassments, including but not limited to the Android robot urinating on the Apple logo, Google has shut down Maps Editor. Maps Editor allowed any average Joe citizen cartographer to update map information for millions of users to see in Google Maps and Google Earth. But apparently there was so much spam that Google couldn't keep up if you go to the site now, you'll see a warning like this one that Maps Editor will be unavailable starting tomorrow, May 12th. After previous incidents, Google has moved to a manual editing process and they simply can't keep up. In other Google news, the Associated Press made headlines today by declaring that Google be more transparent about their self-driving car project, at which point Chris Ermson, director of Google's self-driving car project, took to Medium's back channel home to both, both honest reporting and some PR spin. He announced there that yes, their cars have been in accidents, but it wasn't the car's fault. After six years and 1.7 million miles, the cars have been in 11 minor accidents, including light damage and no injuries. On their website, Time Magazine points out that this is higher than the 2.8 property damage only accidents per million miles traveled that involved passenger cars nationally in 2012, to which Google says that this isn't accurate because most people don't report minor accidents, to which I say, have you read Stephen King's Christine? It's the one, you know, the car takes over and scary. Couldn't justify spending $7.99 a month for the New York Times new mobile app. Now you can, now you don't have to. The app is free and ad supported. CNET it reports that the app is limited to the iPhone now. You can't even get it on the iPad. And if you're on Android, you still need a subscription. And finally, the long and arduous wait for the Giphy for Gmail extension is over. Now you can easily find, embed, and send animated GIFs straight from your email. If you want to call them GIFs, you can do that too. Both The Verge and Engadget both reported this story, and both of them described this Gmail extension using the word glorious, which just proves that GIFs and emoji are making all of us lose our grasp on language. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. We've been asking you to tag or send in your selfies watching or listening to Tech News Tonight. And we received a few more submissions. So today's TN2 selfie fan of the day is Chris Peitschman, who lives near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He posted the following tweet with this photo. It's Tech News Tonight, except during the day with Megan Maroney and Twit. Thanks, Chris, for the post and for the shout out. If you want us to show your selfie on the air, you can post it on Twitter or Google+. Plus and tag it with hashtag TN2Selfie. You can also send it directly to TN2 at twit.tv. And if you want to subscribe to this show, you can do that with any podcast catcher you like at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And we like when you watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.